Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to be speaking about uh, joint work with uh, Yamazaki uh, and Witten and another joint project with uh, Jonya Yagi. So there's been a lot of work over many years um, linking uh, quantum field theory, is this thing work? And uh, quantum groups. I mean, starting with the work of Witten in the late 80s on Chern Simons theory, linking Chern Simons theory with certain uh, integrable spin systems. So in the last few years, I've been working to, to generalize this by considering higher dimensional analogs of Chern Simons theory. So, uh, so work in progress with Yamazaki and Witten, all about that. And I have a paper from 2013 on this topic. But there's a, in parallel, there's been a very active developments relating um, algebraic geometry, particularly the study of quiver varieties in quantum groups. And uh, this is a huge field, and I've just list listed some of the more kind of prominent uh, authors, but there's been many, many people doing great work in this area. So the goal of today's talk is to show how the quantum field theories we're considering can be linked directly to the algebraic geometry by embedding the quantum field theories into string theory and using string dualities. So actually, I realized uh, when looking at the abstracts, now Nikita has the same topic. So maybe we will be treating it the same or treating it differently, uh, uh, we will see. So the theory I'm focusing on today is a four-dimensional cousin of chern simons theory, um, which is related to the Yang-Yin, um, depending on what background we put it on, also to the quantum loop group or the elliptic quantum group. So this is a theory defined on a four-manifold, one of whose directions is holomorphic and two of which are topological. But there is also, you know, th there's the original chern simons theory, and these theories extend all the way up to dimension six. I'm just putting in here this in here to indicate that what what I'm discussing today is part of a larger program. So the five-dimensional version I've studied in two recent papers, and this five-dimensional gauge theory is related to two variable quantum groups, which have come to prominence recently in mathematics, in particular in Andre's work on, um, on uh, affine quiver varieties. So l let me just start by, let's see. Ah, so the main goal of today's talk is to explain why this 4D theory explicitly how to see the quantum groups directly from the 4D theory. And from this, we'll be able to see why these physical systems have, for instance, Yang-Yin symmetry. OK, so let me give you some background about the 4D gauge theory I'll be considering. So we'll mostly be considering it just on flat space, or 2 times c. And the fundamental field is a connection, but just with three components. Um, if you prefer, you can think of it as a four-component connection with an extra gauge symmetry, which gauge is away the z component. And the action is the Chern Simons action, but I've hit it with dz to make it into a, uh, a four form. Now, it turns out that this theory can be consistently defined at the quantum level, and it's topological in the xy plane and holomorphic in the z plane. Hmm. Now, if you give me a representation, of the Lie algebra, which I use to build where my gauge fields live, I can use that to build a Wilson line, just like in an ordinary gauge theory. However, because I don't have the z component of the connection, I can't do parallel transport in the z plane. I can only do it in the xy plane. So these Wilson lines are constrained to live in two directions. So the fundamental fact that relates this theory to the theory of integrable systems and quantum groups is the following. So consider this consider configuration here. We're going to take our gauge group to be SU2 for simplicity. Take the fundamental representation of SU2. We consider two Wilson lines which cross and which live at different values of z, dif different points in the, in the z plane. When they cross, I can take states at the bottom and bring them up to states at the top. This will give you some linear operator from C2 tensor C2 to itself. And the, the fundamental theorem is that this linear operator is, is the OR matrix for the, for the six vertex model over the XXX spin chain. Now, this generalizes to you know, other groups, other representations. We place C by C star, an elliptic curve, and so on. But this is the basic case. Uh, yeah? 
Yes, absolutely. This is a good point. I, this, this point, um, I was kind of glossing over this point, but there's, um, if you write down the Feynman diagrams, there's a two-loop anomaly that appears, which explains this fact. So, yes. It's kind of, it took us a very long time to figure out this, this, this fact, but... Okay, so, the fact that the theory is topological means that um, the Yang-Baxter equation just holds for obvious reasons, just like it does in Chern simons theory. Um, all we do is we draw three Wilson lines and we just slide them around in the topological plane. Since they're far away from each other in the Z-plane, the Yang-Baxter equation is manifest. Now, there's an extra subtlety. I, I mentioned, I said the theory was topological. Really, it's a framed TFT in this topological plane. So I'm, I'm drawing this subtlety um, because it will be important later. So one way in which this framing anomaly is manifest is that at the quantum level, if I tried to have a bent Wilson line at a fixed value of z, it, it's anomalous, but this anomaly can be cancelled by making it shift in the holomorphic plane. So here, let's just think we can work. There we go. So if I bend it through an angle, if, I, if it deviates from being straight by, by some, some angle pi minus theta, then I must shift by h bar, which is a loop expansion parameter, times pi minus theta, times uh, the joule coxeter number of the group. And I think I forgot a factor of pi, 1 over pi, some, some normalization factor. So, uh, people who like TFT will immediately recognize this as the familiar feature in the Yangian that the double joule of a representation is the same representation shifted by, by this factor. Okay, so in this theory, one can ask, how can I start from this physical theory and produce, produce an actual associative algebra? So, in my original approach to this, I, what I said was, we take the algebra of local operators and we take its causal dual. And I show that this is the Yang Yin. You know, the algebra of local operators is an associative algebra just by the OPE in one of the topological directions. The problem with this is, you know, if you want to talk to physicists, it's just, it's just too abstract. And it's kind of a bit unphysical to them. So, what we've been doing recently is, we, we realized how the RTT presentation of the Yang Yin has a very nice explanation in terms of field theory. This also works um, in the rational analytic cases. In fact, we can get it to work as well for any group except E8, which is kind of annoying. So let me explain how this works. So we consider the following configuration, where there's an arbitrary horizontal Wilson line and a vertical Wilson line in the fundamental representation at some point z. Now, if I place incoming and outgoing states at the end of the vertical Wilson line, um, well, that will lead to some operator on the states at the end of the horizontal Wilson line. Call that operator tij of z. Now, if we expand this near z is infinity, near where z is infinity, I get a series. The leading term is delta ij. This is because we're, uh, implicit in everything I've been doing is there's a choice of boundary condition as z equals infinity, where all the fields are trivial. So when things are infinitely separated, they don't interact. And then there are corrections, which give, you, give rise to a sequence of operators on this vector space w. The claim is that these, these operators will define a representation of the Yangian of GLN. Um, okay, how, could we, how can we see the Yangian relations? The idea is that we'll, we'll see them by considering Wilson lines which cross. We make the vertical Wilson lines cross. Now, if we consider the figure on, on the left, ah, this thing doesn't work as well. 
If I have a crossing, this is going to affect the way I label the states at the top. Because I can take this crossing very near the top, and you know, the crossing is given by the OR matrix, so it affects the way I label the states at the top. So I just get an expression like this, where there's no crossing, but I've changed the labeling of the states at the top by a factor given by the OR matrix. On the other hand, over here, if I have two vertical Wilson lines, this is just going to be given by the product of the operators on the horizontal Wilson lines, because I can take them to be separated, and I, I, I do the operator associated to this one, and then I do the operator associated to this one. Now, topological invariance means that it doesn't matter where the crossing is. It can be, be above or below the horizontal Wilson line. And I'll get the same answer. So this, this leads to the following identity, which schematically is or TT. Or TT is TT or. So this is the very classical or TT presentation of the Yangian for GLN, introduced, I think, by Russia Tikhon and Fedeev, Taktajan maybe, in the 80s, like before Dunfeld's presentation. So this, so what we've learned is that if we work with the, the group GLN, or UN, every Wilson line carries canonically an action of the Yangian for GLN. So how would we do other groups? How would we do SLN, SO, E7, etc.? Well, we need, we need to add on other relations to the, um, to the RGT re relation. So, these relations come from um, what we call vertices. So, at the classical level, if we have an invariant tensor in some tensor products of uh, some representations of our Lie algebra, then classically we'll, we can build a gate invariant configuration by made it making our Wilson lines meet and placing the invariant tensor at the end. Because the tensor is invariant, this configuration is, invari is preserved by the gauge transformations which vanish at infinity. So this is a classically gauge invariant operator. Now, just like any classically gauge invariant configuration, there may be quantum anomalies. So in our setting, there, there, it turns out there are one-loop anomalies which come from considering Feynman diagrams like this. So there, there are some, you know, there are gluons exchanged by the Wilson lines, and then there's some external guy A. This game, this configuration may be failed to be gauge invariant under gauge transformations of A, leading to an anomaly. So we calculated by just kind of fun with Feynman diagrams uh, what the anomaly is, and here's the formula. So we take the, here x indicates the ghost field, if you like, the generator for gauge transformations. So it fails to be gauge invariant because, you know, it's some non-trivial dependence on the generator for gauge transformations, which involves the first z derivative of the gauge transformation. And then there's expre expression here. We take the angles between the lines, minus pi, the Lie algebra structure constants, and here by Tb, Sub so i, this means the generator of the Lie algebra acting on the i the Wilson line. And then I apply it to this invariant tensor. So if you think about how this transforms under G, we can view it as a linear map from the Lie algebra to the tensor product of our Wilson lines. OK, so this was a, kind of just a fun one-loop cal calculation, 1,000 quantum field theory. Now one can ask, what can I do to possibly cancel this anomaly? Well, there are two things I can do. I can vary the angles, because they appear specifically in the formula, or I can shift the lines in the z-plane. Now, if the lines don't actually meet, if I shift them in the z-plane so they don't actually meet, clearly that generates a classical anomaly, which can potentially cancel this one. But actually, these things are just the same by the framing anomaly, 
the framing anomaly tells us that rotating something is the same as shifting it. So because these are the same, there's really only one thing we can do. And we can take it to be just moving the angles between the Wilson lines. So here's a situation in which we can cancel them, cancel the anomaly. So firstly, suppose there are exactly two copies of G um, in the tensor product of our representations. Why two? Well, it looks like there are three parameters, namely the angles between the lines. But actually, an overall rotation is redundant, because clearly that can't affect the anomaly. So there's two parameters we can vary to try to cancel the anomaly. So if there are two copies of G, then I can cancel them by varying these two parameters. So this, this tells us that there's some configuration which cancels the anomalies. What is it? If you look back at our formula, you can play around with uh, with the algebras, and you can calculate that the unique solution which cancels the anomalies is given by this expression. So here the CIs are the action of the quadratic Casimirs on my three representations. I'm assuming that the VIs are irreducible representations. And I'm assuming, which I didn't want to discuss, but which Andre brought up, that these representations themselves do not have their own anomaly. So the representations lift to representations of the Yangian. So then the thetas must be given by this kind of very strange formula involving the quadratic Casimirs. So I thought this was really fun, because so explicit. Here are some examples. We take the Lie algebra to be SLN. We take um, our representations, two of them to be the fundamental, and one of them to be the jewel of the exterior square of the fundamental. Then there's an obvious invariant tensor. And you can calculate by calculating the quadratic Casimirs what these angles have to be. So you see, for instance, if n becomes large, then there's two fundamentals kind of become very close to each other. So it like, feels like the exterior square guy is very heavy or something like that. So another fun example, if we take g to be SO, say, 4n, just. Um, I take two copies of the, I take the positive and negative chirality spin representations there. And I take the vector representation. And there's an invariant tensor given by the gamma matrices. Um, by plugging in this formula, we figure out what the angles have to be. And in this case, these angles become pi over 2 when n is sufficiently large. And these guys become pi. So the, the, I think in each case, the, the actual angles I've drawn are for the case n is maybe 6 up here and 3 down there or something like that. Here's another simple case. I take the determinant. It's an invariant tensor for SLN. Well, the determinant is cyclically symmetric. This tells us that if I can cancel the anomaly, I must be able to do so in such a way that the cyclic symmetry is not broken. So the angles just have to be, for symmetry reasons, 2 pi over n. Another example, I take the fundamental representation of G2. Again, because it's, uh, the, there's an invariant tensor, invariant anti-symmetric 3 tensor, by symmetry, the angles just have to be 2 pi over 3. OK, so we've had this kind of digression into discussing when can Wilson lines meet with each other and what, are the, what do the angles have to be. But we started off by asking, what is the, um, uh, how do I see the Yang in by considering uh, the field theory? So these vertices will give rise to extra relations in the RCT algebra. So the reason is the following. So, we can consider crossing a horizontal Wilson line, which has some auxiliary vector space W with, with vertical Wilson lines, 
and making these vertical Wilson lines meet in a vertex. So if you think about what this does, every time I cross, I get this op these operators on the horizontal Wilson lines I was calling T, I, K, Z. And if I have a, a lot of them, then I'm taking a product of a bunch of those guys. And then at the top, I'm implying my invariant tensor. So this expression gives rise to this product of operators on, in the auxiliary vector space W. Now, evidently, I can move the horizontal line above this whole configuration because it's topological. Now, in this thing, there are no crossings with, the, with this horizontal line. So in terms of this line W, whatever I get over here is a multiple of the identity. And which multiple of the identity? It's, of course, the multiple of the identity given by this invariant tensor. So we get this expression that some product of these TIJZs with particular values of the spectral parameters is a multiple of the identity. And this will give us extra relations in the RTT algebra, which will cut it down to give you the Yangian for the Lie algebra we're considering. So as an example, it's well known that the Yangian for SLN is given by adding, adding on a relation called the quantum determinant. And here's how it arises. So this is kind of fun. So we consider the vertex for the determinant. So as I mentioned, the vertex for the determinant has angles of 2 pi over 6. If I, in this case, when n is 6, in general, it's 2 pi over n for SLN. Now, how do we figure out these particular values of the spectral parameter? The answer is we use the framing anomaly. As I bend my Wilson line to make it vertical, I must, I must shift in the z plane by the amount I've, I've bent. So because of the angles between any two guys is 2 pi over 6, the shift here must be proportional to you know, uh, 2 over 6 times h bar times the dual coxeter number. So we get this expression. Now, of course, it doesn't matter if I move my horizontal Wilson line vertically. Because our vertex was a determinant, and because of these particular shifts, and because the dual coxeter number of SLN is n, we get this identity, which is known in the literature as the quantum determinant relation, and tells us that the Yangian, you know, the Yangian for SLN is obtained by imposing the RTT relation plus this extra relation coming from this vertex. So what's the strategy to understand um, the Yangian, or indeed the quantum loop group, or the elliptic quantum group? And I don't, don't, wanna, don't really have time to talk about the, the other two, uh, the rational uh, and elliptic cases, uh, sorry, trigonometric and elliptic cases. So the strategy is, first, we do something really classical. We take our group, we take its smallest dimensional representation, and we say, our group is the automorphisms of this representation, preserving some tensors. For example, SON is the automorphism of the vector representation, preserving the, the symmetric pairing. And G2, it's the automorphism of the seven-dimensional representation, preserving the symmetric pairing and the, and the cubic tensor. Then we must lift these invariant tensors to vertices between w quantum Wilson lines. And then we'll add the corresponding relations to the RTT relation. OK. Now, of course, one, one can make, classically, there's no problems with writing down you know, the, the correct list of tensors for every group. One, runs, one's in, one might run into problems when we try to quantize it. And this is why we, we don't understand E8 at the moment. So the first thing one has to do is to say, well, can I actually quantize the Wilson line itself in the lowest dimensional representation? For every group except E8, you can, but the lowest representation of E8 is the adjoint, and the adjoint representation of E8 
has this two-loop anomaly I mentioned to Andre, cannot be quantized. I don't know. It's, this is a classical fact of, of representation theory of the Yang in, which representation, representation theorists will know. Um, then one can ask, you know, can I quantize the vertex? Are there only two copies of the adjoint in a cubic vertex? In each of these cases I listed, the answer is yes. Uh, for E7, it's kind of a bit more subtle. And then one can write down the corresponding quantum uh, network of Wilson lines um, and produce the extra relations in the RTT algebra to give a kind of clear physical presentation of the Yangian and the other groups. So let me say what happens for E7 because it's kind of fun. Uh, so for E7, let me. For E7, there's a quadratic and a quartic relation, and the quartic relation. Um, as well as the, there are some quadratic relations which are just a formal consequence of the existence of the quadratic relation, but the, the interesting new one, you can view it as a, as, as a projection onto the 463 dimensional representation of E7. So we calculate the two loop anomaly it vanishes for this representation. There's a cubic vertex, we calculate the angles between it, and then we draw this configuration. And we conclude. If you, if you calculate the, the angles correctly using the, the formula for the Casimir, the action of the Casimir and these representations, that the shifts in Z are given like this. And this configuration equals to this configuration. And you find an explicit formula for a, a, new, a relation that, that gives you the Yangian of E7. OK, so let me, in slight talks, the problem with slight talks is they go too fast. So I don't. Uh, let me go on to explaining the motivation for this. I suppose our, our motivation originally was we want to understand why do these quantum groups have anything to do with these Lagrangian field theories? And this is it's really that's a kind of, it's a problem one encounters even in Chern Simons theory. What does the Rashtikin derived construction of not invariants using quantum groups, why is that of anything, anything to do with Witten's construction with uh, path integrals? And this is not obvious at all. Um, so what we were answering, answering was in some way a 4D version of this question. In fact, our methods will also apply to the original 3D, 3D version. Um, but once we have these techniques, what they allow us to do is to give an explanation for why many physical systems have quantum group symmetry. So an explanation which does not involve calculating anything, uh, or does not involve any formulas, but just involves like embedding one physical system in the 4D gauge theory, which is related to the Yangian and the quantum loop group. So an example which we're working on, uh, but we, we've worked out some aspects of this, but have not yet written the paper about this, is the um, it's a famous story about two-dimensional integrable field theories, um, which tend to have Yangian or quantum group symmetry. So in our setting, we see that the two-dimensional integrable field theories can be engineered by embedding certain surface defects in our 4D gauge theory. And then just by drawing pictures in quantum field theory, we make it manifest that they have Yangian symmetry. So other examples. Um, the work of Nekrasov Shatishvili um, and related work of Malika Kunkov explain that, that, the comp that uh, certain uh, 2D theories have quantum group symmetry. So I'm, I might say a little bit about this at the end, but the main example I want to focus on today is a result of these. Uh, Ten people, and in fact, I've even had to leave out some people who were kind of <laughs> who did some related work earlier, um, which says that the the algebra of monopole operators in a 3D n equals four gauge theory in an omega background uh, for a certain quiver gauge theory is a quotient of the Yangian. So I'd like to explain kind of from the point of view of this 
uh, four-dimensional gauge theory we're considering here, why this is true. But just as an example of the general method. So to get there, well, the first thing we have to do is to embed the four-dimensional gauge theory we're considering into string theory. So then, then we can apply string dualities and relate it to quiver gauge theories. So the theorem is, uh, if we consider a D5 brain in the presence of a Ramon Ramon 2 form, also a dilaton, which I haven't written down, then after twisting, the theory on the D5 brain localizes just to four directions, the x0 up to x3 directions, and is equivalent to this 4D Chern Simons theory related to the Yan mean. So this, the string theory background we're considering is uh, related by T-duality to M theory here, where I take a twisted product of S1 with two copies of C, and an M5 brain on these underlying directions. So if I reduce to 2A, I'll find a D4 brain with um, a Ramon Ramon one form field and a dilaton. And then by applying T-duality here, I'll get this set up. So clearly, this is some, some kind of omega background. It is not, is not exactly the omega background originally considered by Nikita, because it is not, does not arise by taking a seven-dimensional gauge theory and doing a twisted dimensional reduction. So, so once we have this theorem, it's kind of standard string theory arguments become, e become uh, into hand, and there are lots of easy things we can say. If we have an F1 ending on these D5 brains, they will give us Wilson lines, as usual, in, but now in the fundamental representation. Similarly, we could have some D3s. Here they wrap x4, x0, x4, x5. These three directions are inside the D5 brain, and this direction is uh, orthogonal to the D, D3 brain. x4 and x5 are the directions in where there's a Ramon Ramon uh, form is turned on, so they're a kind of an omega background. So these will give rise to um, a Wilson line living in the n tensor power of the symmetric algebra of the fundamental. This just comes by considering the bifundamental, uh, the D3, D5 strings. Now, if we apply this, if we consider this con configuration of D3s passing through D5s and apply S-duality, we'll get D3s passing through NS5s, and so a linear quiver gauge theory, like this, where there's n plus one nodes. So this, the linear quiver gauge theory, it'll be a 3D n equals 4 gauge theory. And it will be in an omega background because of the S dual. The S dual of the background we're considering will be the standard omega background on this, uh, this uh, 3D n equals 4 gauge theory. OK, so our conclusion. Oh, I should say one more point. Everything is topologically twisted. One can analyze which twist of the 3D n equals 4 gauge theory we find. The twist we see is the one where the local operators parameterize the Coulomb branch and not the Higgs branch. OK, so the conclusion of this is that there is a Wilson line in our 4D gauge theory where the local operators on the Wilson line are these monopole operators in the linear quiver gauge theory. So by our general discussion with the RTT algebra, we conclude that there, there is a homomorphism from the Yangian to this algebra. But this is what um, Bullimore, Diofte, Dimofte, Bullimore, Dimofte, Gaioto, Bravelman, Finkelberg, Kamenitzer, Kodera, Nakajima, Webster, and Weeks proved. Uh, OK, so since I'm actually finishing a bit early, Um, it's actually worth noting that for finite n, the algebra is a quotient of the Yangian, but as n goes to infinity, it's actually isomorphic to the Yangian for SLN. The reason for this is this is holography. 
as n goes to infinity, the d3 reigns kind of get, go away, and we're just left with the NS5 uh, system in the presence of, of type 2b. So the only thing, thing we find is the stuff on the NS5 frame. So this is OK. So you can even do a little better. Because we have this understanding, actually, I should say in the cases, in the DNE cases, with a little bit of work, one can do something similar using the presentation of the Yangian we derived in the DNE cases, except for E8. Um, and the rational elliptic cases, there is some, it's quite a bit more subtle. Maybe I'll explain why that is. So in the, why did I say rational? Trigonometric. In the rational case, which we've been considering, to make everything work, we need to choose a boundary condition when z goes to infinity, where all of our fields go to zero. In the presence of this boundary condition, I mean, when we compactify in the z, pl z plane with this boundary condition, there are no zero modes, and the effect of 2D theory is, is massive. In fact, infinitely massive. And this is essential to make these things work. Because, for instance, I've been talking rather glibly about the states at the end of a Wilson line. In a general quantum field theory, the states at the end of a Wilson line does not make sense, per se. Rather, the Wilson line modifies the Hilbert space of the theory itself. So, so one can only talk about this, the states in the couple system. In this particular theory, because when we compactify it in the z-plane, it becomes massive, the Hilbert space of the theory itself is trivial, and one can actually talk about the states at the end of a Wilson line and make this story work. Now, in the rational and elliptic cases, we have to, in the rational case, we have to impose certain boundary conditions. Sorry, the trigonometric case. In the trigonometric case on a cylinder, we have to impose certain boundary conditions at 0 and infinity. And these boundary conditions break G symmetry. So at 0, they have to lie in the positive Borel. At infinity, they have to lie in the negative Borel, plus an extra subtlety. In the elliptic case, it only works in type A. We have to work in a background of a non-trivial PSLN bundle on an elliptic curve, which has no deformations. Now, again, to, to have no zero modes. Um, so I mentioned this because the embedding of the rational and elliptic cases in string theory has extra subtleties that I don't fully understand right now. Okay, so can we see explicitly how the Yangian acts um, on this quiver gauge theory? Well, if we think about the RTT presentation, we see the following. So, um, at the top, I have a, a fundamental Wilson line, which comes from an F1. And at the bottom, I have an arbitrary Wilson line, in this case coming from a D3. And I choose incoming and outgoing states to the Wilson line at the top. And they'll exchange a gluon to get an operator acting on the bottom. So I've just written this. The single gluon exchange is just the leading order contribution. But there will be a bunch of contributions to higher orders. Now, in string theory, we can rewrite this whole configuration in terms of strings. Up here, we have, we're going to have an F1 ending here. But this gluon exchange is also mediated by an F1 ending on the D5. And at the bottom, we'll have a D3. So if you think about the picture, you'll find that um, the, to leading order, the action of the Yangian must be realized by um, a configuration like this, which generates some operators on the D f acting on the D3, D5 strings. If we apply S duality, this becomes a D1, and a D1 ending on a D3 generates in a toothed line. And when these two D3s become together, we get a monopole. And this leads to an expression 
which matches the leading order term in what um, Tudor and friends wrote down for the action of, of the Yangian, or the homomorphism from the Yangian to the ring of monopole operators of the quiver gauge theory. Okay. So let me say a little bit about a slightly technical point. So we've been talking rather glibly about all these brain systems, but at some stage we will have to decouple the D5 or NS5 from the D3s in order to isolate the actual 3D N equals 4 gauge theory and not the 3D N equals 4 gauge theory coupled to some other nonsense that you don't want. Now this, this point is important. It's related to the issue I mentioned earlier about how you need to be careful about the boundary conditions for the 4D gauge theory to actually find the Yangian and not something else. So recall we have this setup. The D5 reigns on the X0 up to X5, and D3 reigns on these directions. And a Ramon Ramon 2 form, whose 3 form field strands looks like this. So on the D3 brain, the usual story is we would impose you know, Jewishly boundary conditions in the direction far away from the NS5. On the D5, as I mentioned, we impose a boundary condition in this holomorphic plane when it goes to infinity. Now the important point is that when we compactify the D5 on this plane, we will get the trivial theory all the fields become massive, and in fact, infinitely massive after twisting. There's no propagating degrees of freedom. So this tells us that this entire system, when compactified to two dimensions, is equivalent to the quiver gauge theory in the omega background. So one doesn't have to worry about taking, you know, carefully taking limits, and really, I mean, without this kind of argument, uh, it would not be convincing to show that Wilson lines in the D5 brain would give you an action of the Yangian. Okay. Um, so let me, just my last slide, let me just discuss um, other examples of this process. So the example which was in my abstract, and I decided it was easier to discuss this other one, is the Nekrasov Shadashvili correspondence. So this is how this works is you it's a similar story to what we just discussed. One considers in type 2A a D2 NS5 system where the D2 brains are wrapped in a circle. If we apply T and S duality, the D2 brains become F1s ending on D5. And we find that the states of the D2 brains are given are realized as the states at the end of a number of copies of fundamental Wilson lines in our theory. Thus, we match with the usual spin system. And we can go further to understand operators coming from, uh, uh, for example, uh, D2s ending there. So, so this is work in progress with Jenny Yagi. Um, one can also consider 3D n equals 4 theories for affine quivers. Um, so I studied these in a recent paper. And what one finds is kind of similar to the finite quiver case, that the, the algebra of local operators in the 3D n equals 4 theory in an omega background is a quotient not of the Yangian, but of a two-variable cousin of the Yangian. And when n goes to when the rank of the gauge group goes to infinity, it becomes this whole algebra. And there's a similar explanation, but not in terms of a 4D Chern Simons theory, but in terms of a 5D Chern Simons theory. Um, I see another example. This is beautiful work of Molika Kunkov and Ettingoff Schiffman. And they show that the affine Yangian acts on the cohomology of instant on moduli spaces. Now, the affine Yangian is also a two variable quantum group. So one will not be surprised by considering, by re to realize that it comes from this 5D Chern Simons theory as well, but with a slightly different configuration. Um, and here, the, 
the relevant operators here are now surface defects instead of line defects. So in a certain specialization of, this, of the parameters, I was able to derive their statement from this field theory setup as well. Um, yeah, so there are many open problems. In particular, the 5D case, I would love to understand an RGT presentation like we just discussed. And the 6D case seems to be completely open. Okay, so I'll, uh, I'll stop there. <laughs>